know why you're doing it. Only do it if it's something that makes you so happy that you want to do 24 hours a day. It's a difficult industry. It's a very difficult industry, but you have to do it because you love it. You start with that and then you must practice. Rich, I have known you for many, many years. Yes. And you have always impressed me as being someone that is persistent, just passionate about what you do. You are always focused. You're honest. You're hardworking. You know how to be assertive to get what you want to get in a very polite way. You have many qualities that are really qualities that should be studied for the next generation to understand. Well, thanks, Ben. Thank so you. I thank you so much for joining us. Means a us lot. Here at the it sessions. means a lot. Thank, <laughs> thank you, my friend. Tell me where you've been so helpful to me over the years. I remember vividly sitting in my car in front of the Hermitage, Tennessee post office, <laughs> calling you for advice about cultivating my my. Yeah. clinic career yeah. and you're like just do it just yeah. go out there and do it and make it happen and then i opened up pandora's box <laughs> because for the first maybe like seven years i was with jason ld maybe yeah. eight years i had no drum tech yeah. so i would have to set up my drum set in the morning and change the heads tune clean all that stuff and we were playing like rodeo so they were dusty and you know cow feces <laughs> on the drums and everything and that's crazy for an ocd person just and then i would have to go set up my drums for a clinic and then go back and do sound check with Aldine and then go do my clinic and then yeah. break down those drums and then go and do the sh show with Aldine and break those. I was doing it like six times a day. Beautiful. But over a, a decade, I was able to like, you know, build up a, a body of work, I guess, as an educator. This Thanks is what to you. It, thank you so much. This is what it takes. It takes that level of hard work, which you're not afraid to do. And it takes that. And for the generations to understand that, you really have to have that drive and that motivating force, sure. which you clearly have. Sure. Where did it start? Where did, how did music enter your life when you were young? What happened? I, I think I'm the black sheep. You know, my no one in my family plays music. <laughs> you know, but I think my dad secretly wanted to play drums, you know? And he'll smile when he hears that because he was just kind of like a dashboard drummer. But my, my dad was in the military and then he went to school nights and he became an accountant. And my mom is a nurse and they were both just retired. They're in Florida, you know, doing their thing, happy, active. Uh, but they saw that they're like, do you want to play the drums? Because I was just like hitting everything, you know, super restless, high energy. And so I'm from Connecticut, New England kid. They take me to drum lessons, the Milford Percussion and Guitar Workshop. <laughs> Jack Berge, a guy named Jack Berge was my uh, teacher. I'd love to visit with him sometime. Um, and he put the sticks in my hand and taught me about, you know, posture and how to hold the sticks and rudiments. And I was working out of these Joel Rothman books and I was listening to Kiss and I was hooked. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I knew it was really what I wanted to do when the police came out with the Synchronicity record, 1983. Mm -hmm. yeah, really is, yeah. Martha Quinn and all the VJs on MTV and we were glued to our TV sets every day waiting <laughs> for the next police video, waiting for the next Van Halen video and I was like, that's what I'm gonna do with my life. And, and I haven't stopped, I haven't looked back. I've been playing the drums. I guess I went professional, I guess, and when I was 18, started getting paid for it. And this is many years later. Fantastic. <laughs> Tell me about being a professional. How did that first start out? Were you first, first started booking gigs and stuff? Yeah, right? just, you know, playing, you know, in cumbia bands in El Paso, Texas. I grew up, when I was 11, I moved to El Paso, Texas. I don't know why I never learned how to speak Spanish. I just went to Mexico City and I was like, I don't know how to speak Spanish. I grew up in El Paso. Why didn't I do this? So, but anyways, no, I was playing in, in, in a band called Pueblo which I guess means village. Yes. And we were playing Tex-Mex music, cumbias, and I learned about you know ethnic percussion. And meanwhile, I was also going to Texas Tech University. Mm -hmm. I was getting my, my undergraduate degree with Alan Shin at Texas Tech University. I got my degree in music education and I got a teaching certificate for the state of Texas. And then I went to the University of North Texas and studied with you know Ed Sof, Henry Oxtell, Robert Chitroma, Ron Fink, you know, all the great teachers there, part of that Legends. that, that yeah, legacy. Yeah, yeah. And that was a really wonderful period of musical growth. And when I was there, I was gigging all around Denton, Texas and Dallas, Texas. And, and I was in a very robust class of drummers. I mean, I was at school with Keith Carlock and Rob Sherian and Blair Sinta and uh, Jason Sutter and Jim Riley. And, you know, Jim Riley, you guys spent the weekend together, you yeah, know? Absolutely. I mean, so we were all in school, you know, just trying to be the best drummers we possibly could. Yeah in the university and taking advantage of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex music scene, which has a pretty healthy music scene. There's yeah. there's big band music, there was fusion, there was smooth jazz. There were, I played in a reggae band and we had original rock bands and horn bands. It was a great time. So you life. have a full array of genres that you've studied and that you play. 
anything from Greek wedding music to, I mean, I tell her, I tell all the kids, look, at, I have kicked jokes for comedians. I have, <laughs> I have opened for the puppet show. I have played, you know, the, um, the biker bar. I've played a pool party, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, divorce parties uh, with steel drum bands, anything you could possibly play, That's great. you know? You put that, all that into your bag of tricks and you become a, like a snowflake, you know, cause we're all, snowflakes are all unique. Yeah. They're all one of a kind, just like human beings are, you know, so we all, we all may have the same influences. We all may listen to the same kind of music. We all may study with the same drum teacher. We're all going to come out sounding different. That's if you want to sound different. Yeah. That's a very important part to find that individual sound, which you have found. I mean, you really have, you know, found the niche of, of your, yeah. of your style and, and style. Which is a luxury. My original goal was to be able to just cover a lot of styles. Like someone say, here, you know, here, boom, here, put a chart in front of you. This is uh, the Born Supremacy 2, go. You know, I mean, or, a, you know, a big band job or a cruise ship job or doing recording sessions where they go, okay, we don't have a chart. Well, let's all scribble out my own chart. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to be able to cover a lot of styles and I moved to Nashville. What Nashville taught me was, of course, studying guys like Eddie Bears and Lonnie Wilson and Chad Cromwell and Paul Lyme and uh, Greg Morrow. And the, all these guys that were my heroes are now my friends and colleagues. I have their cell phone number. I go, let's get a martini, Eddie. You know, but studying them, literally going and buying all the cassettes. You know, when I moved here, I'm very, I'm dating myself, but I got, I bought everything on cassette and I was looking up everyone's discography and I was transcribing things and I was playing along with things. And then you soak up all that stuff. In 1999, I played in 27 bands around Nashville. There was a single scheduling problem. Like I was able to juggle 27 different bands. Most of them don't exist anymore. Most of those people have quit the music business. So it's really just a, a matter of survival. You know, like you just don't quit. Don't quit, just keep moving forward. And I found my, one of my goals in life was to find my Sting, find my Billy Joel, find my John Mellencamp, find my Elton John, find my Bono. And in 1999, I met a young singer named Jason Aldean. I started working with him from 1999 to 2004 while I was working with a million other people. And he got signed to a record deal. And from creating that relationship, cultivating that relationship, he knew that he had found his band, his recording band and his touring band. Huge. We're about to celebrate, um, I think, nine, almost 19 years of working together consistently. Same band, same producer, same recording band, same everything, you know, just, it made me realize uh, even more the power of relationships. This is unheard of in the industry. The this is band. really, really a rarefied air because the music business can be a treacherous place. Loyalty is very rare yeah. and so when, just to be gainfully employed yeah. in the music business is such a, such a luxury. You know? But this is a part of what fate is about because you have networked yourself so clear by having you know great morals and great values and, and you're very honest and you've kept that up and yeah. that's going to attract people that have those same values. Well, you reap what you sow, right? You reap what you sow and I think that birds of a feather flock together. You know, yeah. So everyone just has to find their team, find their clique, find their network, find their tribe. Yeah. Call it what you want, but it's a people-oriented business, yeah. and it will always be a, based on people. The music business, I think life, it's about people. You yeah. know, surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals and championing each other. And I surround myself with people that are very talented, and uh, if they have skill sets that I don't have, I, I'm the first one to whoo, pay them right away for their yeah. skill set, yeah. you yeah. know? Yeah. But you've opened the door in many areas because you also got involved not only in performing, but doing different sessions, mm -hmm. some teaching, Yeah, you've authored you know, books. I mean, so you have yeah. really a, a wider variety of how you reach this business-like or this entrepreneurial way of looking at the music industry. Sure. Yeah, I think we have to do that. And I don't know, even if we didn't have, say it was the, the golden age of music, the, the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, if it was still that, I would probably still be doing all these things because I know that if I'm doing too much recording, I miss the visceral impact of uh, the immediacy of an audience and that, that style audience, of communication. Yeah, exactly. I think I've always had a teacher's heart, you know what I mean? And I, I love teaching and mm -hmm. teaching reinforces what you do and it just makes you better at what you do. And also, you know, I, I've, I've tried marriage twice and I, I don't have any children, but I, one of the ways that I feel like I can give back to the universe in the world is to teach. 
Mm. And I can teach kids and share my experiences and then they go home with their parents. <laughs> um, but I just, I, I love doing that. And I just, I think it's a, about like not putting limitations on yourself and defining who you are. Because when I moved to Nashville, it was a really clear line in the sand. You are a recording drummer or you are a touring drummer. And mm. I said, I will not buy into that mentality. Mm. My touring work will feed my recording work and my recording work will feed my touring work. And thank God I took that philosophy because now there's a lot of recording drummers in Nashville that would never have thought about going on the road, but because of the state of the music industry and the economy and just wanting to, to continue staying relevant, you have to get on the road a little bit. Absolutely. You have to go. So I'm wearing both hats and then doing the education thing and then uh, realizing that we're in the entertainment business so I'm trying to do it now in my midlife. I'm trying to reinvent myself a little bit and go into some other areas of the entertainment business, which are really fun. And then what's great is I take a little break from the drums and then when I get back to the drums, it's so much more meaningful. Like, oh, I missed you girls. Talk you know? about that. Talk about the fact that, that you're widening your range. Because you know, being a musician, it's, you know, we're artists. It's a full-time commitment. That might, that might lead into acting. That might lead into dance. It's all a part of the arts. I mean, there, you know, Ronnie sure. Tut was a tap dancer and he was talking about and, how he tap danced. Yeah, right? yeah, all these great, great yeah. drummers. Talk about what, what, what your next adventure is with the, what you're doing. Well, I think that, the, you know, the idea of being an author and a host and an MC and a voiceover artist, you inspired me to do these yes. things because you have this whole other, the kids like to call it a side hustle. Now <laughs> we're, you're a brand ambassador and you're an educator and then you get called a lot to host events and yeah. there's charity events. And was, I've, I just noticed that from teaching, all, doing all my clinics, that I'm very comfortable with the microphone. I was like, I was like you know what? Why don't I just put myself out there? Let, them, let the world know that I'm willing to do this. Right. And I think one of the ways you can attract success to your life is just to let the world know what you want to accomplish and doors will open and people want to help you. This is the power of intention. Yes. When you put that out, you let that know. But it's happening. I've seen some clips of you doing some acting stuff. I've yeah. seen you really involved in in pushing yourself to a different level. I think that's absolutely fantastic Thanks, that, you're, that you're putting yourself on the edge of constantly learning. And that's really what the game is. Continuing education, you know, continuing. I just took a uh, improv comedy class <laughs> in Hollywood from the Upright Citizens Brigade. This is Amy Poehler and Tina Fey school. Yeah. Everyone that's there is either a professional comedian or is a professional actor or is, is in the arts and they just want to study improv. So here I am, I'm in this class and there was, my classmates were from like five countries and they're all professional actors and you just have to jump in the water, the deep end of the pool. <laughs> Blood is in the water, sharks are swimming, and that's where you want to be. Yeah. And I grew so much in like four days. Uh, I think anybody in the world that does anything should take an improv comedy class because it teaches you about relationships, seeing patterns, and it teaches you about teamwork, and it teaches you to be absolutely fearless. Because as drummers, we are surrounded by a set of drums. It's almost like a protective barrier. Yeah, absolutely. When you take an improv comedy class, there is an audience member that is five feet away from you and you literally have to make something out of nothing. <laughs> and you very well can fall flat on your face. It's almost like jazz improvisation. Well, that's why I said the creative process, you already have that. When you're, when you're given that, that seed, all you're doing is you're watering it and you're allowing it to go in different directions, which yeah. is fantastic to experience. So are you able to take some of your musical experience into that improv? I think so, because you know we have rhythm, and as musicians, we're trained to listen and interact. And being in a band, there's no higher form of teamwork, yeah. right? And also, a lot of these concepts that I learned uh, about from being a touring drummer, being a session drummer, and being a an educator, I bring that to my keynote speeches because mm -hmm. the same patterns are there as well. We talk about, you know, my philosophy for successful living that I call crash commitment relationships attitude skill hunger now this is a, a success philosophy that can work for a five-year-old it can work for a soccer mom it can work, work for the next person that wants to walk the moon right. the next I, I tell people it even works for bass players <laughs> Dad, I tell my bass player that all the time and he's, he's like really rich um, but uh and it might not all and then the so. bass players tell the drummer jokes right. and it's like but no it, it's just a big love fest the fact that you know we're going out there and we're communicating on the highest level. I think music is one of the highest forms of communication, the highest forms of expression. Yeah. I mean, last night got the, you know, the spot, the, the lights were shining in my eye and my band was on stage and there's 20,000 people out there and they know every word to the song and who has the most responsibility? Yeah, the singer's gotta remember the words, he's yeah. gotta sing in tune, yeah. he's the storyteller, his name is on the marquee, yeah. but the drummer 
sets the pace, the tone, the rhythmic structure, the foundation. I mean, let's face it, the drums in the wrong hands could be a weapon. I mean, really, there's no exact pitches. It's kind of chaos. And it's really up to us to be intentionally, overtly musical yeah. to make it sound musical. It's a lot of responsibility, you know. But you know, you, you do it so well and you do it consistently well, you know, and it's many of these life experiences that we go through that teach us things. I want you to talk a little about a positive take you can pull out of the Vegas scenario. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, that was a, a, that was a, a hard thing, a heartbreaking thing. Um, I, I will say that uh, like all 60 members of our organization, our band and crew are fine, are completely fine, which is like, it just reinforces your beliefs in your higher powers and, and, and the fact that we were spared and now it comes with a great responsibility to, to, to go on and do great things. Just trying to put it back together. Yeah. The phone rings, Lauren Michaels called, we're going to play Saturday Night Live. Nice and then the best thing you could do is just get right back get up on back that horse. It, yeah. And it was just a really amazing mix of feelings. It was sadness, it, it was pride. It, we were, I was playing a television show that I wanted to play since I was 11 years old, yeah. but I didn't want to play the te that television show under those circumstances. Yeah. You know, so then there's guilt. You know, and then there's. But it, was, it was needed. It was needed for you guys to go do that. The, the, it was the, good for us. It the was good for. The country needed that. It's good for America. I was happy I was part of it. Absolutely. Uh, and now from that, security is much better. Yeah, it's going to force people to look at how concert security yeah. goes down, you know. Yeah. But, you know, we were right back at it maybe like, I don't know, 10 days later or something yeah. playing outdoors. Yeah. And I tell everybody, I say, look, it, one crazed person is not going to keep us from fulfilling our destiny, our prophecy, our right. purpose. Our, right. My purpose in life is to affect people in a positive way and change lives. And I do that through music. Right. And I know that everybody in our band feels the same way. And we love entertaining people and we know that the healing properties and the effect it has on people. Right. So we're just gonna keep doing it. You know? <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. When it's your time, it's your time. Yeah. You know, so I, I just gonna live fearlessly. Good for yeah, you, man, yeah. and, and that is inspiring at many levels. What motivates you? You're always on the go, you're always intense, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm that way too. I, yeah. I, I get it, man, we just, we have that's a part of our personality, but what really motivates you? I think a lot of drummers are like that, you know? <laughs> we're the busy bees, we're like, what is this guy on? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, or, or I hear this all the time, God, if I could just bottle your energy, man. Be like, yeah, I wish we could bottle my energy too. I'd be a millionaire. Um, I don't know. I get my. I think I get my energy from my mother. My mother is is retired. She's seventy one, but she's busier than ever. She's in the pottery club and the line dancing club and the book reading club and the martini making club and the, she's got some more clubs and she just goes and goes and goes and she works out two and a half hours a day. She does yoga every day. She does body pump. I went to this body pump class with my mom. She's 71 years old. She's like pumping iron and she's just strong stock, you know. My parents were so encouraging, you know, and that's why when I teach, I like to tell the parents, if the kid is interested in music, if they're interested in anything creative other than surfing the internet or playing with their phone or Xbox, yeah. like get on that, yeah. like support them 100%. But what motivates me? I go back to my purpose, which is to affect people, change lives and affect people in a positive way. And I could do that through music and through drumming and through teaching and through speaking and those things make me happy yeah. so it's this endless cycle it's a cycle of self-empowerment <laughs> you know amazing book you know yeah, um we are the lucky few that really really love our job how many people can say that maybe there's i don't know maybe there's a lot of people that love their job yeah. like people are so intrigued by musicians yeah. because I don't know, when I'm on an airplane and they find out, oh, you're in a band, they're like, well, what's that like? And, mm -hmm. and people just want to come backstage. I'm like, look, at backstage is like sweaty towels, road <laughs> cases, two-day-old cheese. It's like, there's, it's not, there's nothing back there that you want to see. Um, but there's, a, there's this mystique of being the musician, being a, being a troubadour, traveling, waking up in a different city every day. But to do it at a high level, I mean, basically, I'm a side man, you know, so I'm my own manager, I'm my own publicist, I'm my own personal trainer, I'm my own F secretary, my own everything, my yeah. own social media. I, you have to do it, we're running a business. So the, the days of being a musician that just can sleep till noon and this yeah. hope for the, it just doesn't exist. But this is a great entrepreneurial lesson because when you have a cup of coffee in the morning, the entire company wakes up. <laughs> right. That's really what's happening. Right. Here. 
Talk about that. Talk about the business side. How do you balance the business side of doing all of that? Because you're wearing so many hats yeah. and you're doing it well. How do you balance all thank that? Thank you. Thank you. I tell people the days of being a, a jack of all trades master, basically you have to do a lot of things and you have to master all of them. You know, it's like everything I try to do, I try to do at the highest level. And I, and I, there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into it, but if it's, it's about being present, right? It's the, one of the greatest gifts we can give people in this modern age is a gift of our presence. So one of the first things I do if I go to a business meeting with somebody, if I can, I turn my face, I don't, I never have my phone on ring or I never have a vibrate. It's listen, every time I look at my phone, it's like a gift. I'm just delightfully surprised. And I just try to get to, back to that person. With another person, I'll put that phone face down and give that person 100% of my attention. It's the greatest gift we can give each other in this crazy age that we live in. So a lot of pre-planning, but last night I was Jason Aldean's drummer. And so I was playing that role, right. 150%. Monday, what's going on Monday? I might be playing a different role. I might be teaching some lessons and I might be doing a local gig around town where I'm somebody else's drummer and I'm playing that role. So whatever I'm in at that moment, I'm giving 150% to. So I acting can't. is not that far away from really what you do or what any of us does. Well, you know what's really funny is that I've been studying for like three and a half years now. I'm really passionate about it. I've had some great teachers, gone to a, tons of auditions. This is what I tell people. I was like, how many drummers can say that they drove to CBS Studios right there in the heart of Hollywood, had a parking permit, oh, right there, sir, went in through the Carol Burnett entrance and auditioned for one of the longest running soap operas to play the role of Alejandro. <laughs> and it was really funny is that I got off the elevator and there was like 40 Alejandros. <laughs> but I prepared, I had a great attitude, I had a firm handshake, I had a smile on my face, and I went in and I did, it's just like an auditioning for music. You give it everything and then you release it. That's right. You know, and you just release it to the acting gods, you release it to the music gods and you move on with your life because you were gonna find the right situation for you. Right. But what I've realized in these three and a half years is I'm not gonna be going for the parts where I have to wear the white wig and do a British accent and cry on cue. <laughs> I'm gonna do things that are in my lane. I'm gonna be playing a producer, I'm gonna be playing a teacher, I'm gonna be playing a drummer, I'm gonna right. be playing the douchey friend <laughs> next door, I'm gonna play the fun husband, the cool uncle, you know, things that are basically an extension of my personality. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. You know, as I travel around the world, you know, I travel globally at an intense pace, yeah. and I'm in the US and I'll meet a young drummer and they'll say, well, I was at Rich Redmond's camp. Yes. And it's so exciting to hear their enthusiasm when they come by. Just talk a little about the camp and what you do with the that. The camps, yeah. Uh, so for four years, I had this thing called my Drummer's Weekend, which is just a, an experience. Like really, <laughs> life is a collection of experiences, right? So if we get up every day, we just have one amazing day, and we put that next to the next day and the next day, we're gonna have one heck of a life, right? <laughs> so that's how I'm trying to live my life. And what I wanted to do is just get all of my famous drummer friends together and to teach a small group of kids. I never, I don't usually go above, I think, like like 22 kids, like the most I ever have was 22 kids because we want to provide a white glove experience for Good. the kids, something they'll remember for the rest of their lives. Good. So they ride, they got a great hotel, they ride around in the limo, they have catered meals, and they get to hang around with their drum heroes. So I've got, had guys like Kenny Aronoff and Thomas Lang and Liberty yeah, and, Lib and, yeah. and Shulman and like all, you know, all, Troy Lachetta, the best drummers on the planet. Yeah. And the prerequisite for teaching at one of these camps is that yes, you have to be a great drummer, but more than anything, you have to be a great person yeah. who is willing to spend time with younger people. Yeah. What's cool about the camps is that the over the four years, the people that have attended have created this this network and they're all lifting each other up and there's a Facebook community and they're all championing each other and keeping in touch with each other and they're <laughs> recommending each other for jobs and it's really cool. Now Jim and our buddy Jim Riley is doing a thing where he's got a smaller group of kids and it's more intense. It's like one day and they just yeah. work all day. Yeah, and yeah. he goes, "Your he goes, Rich, your thing is more the Hollywood version of it basically cuz I'll, I'll have a like every two hours I'll have there'll be something new so I'll have like a rock drummer and then we'll do a hands thing and then we'll do a timekeeping thing and then a percussionist will come in and then there'll be a uh, then a, there'll be a rhythm section workshop so over the 72 hours the kids are getting like it's basically a crash course Very where exciting. they're just overrun with this information yeah. then they have to go and they have to apply it or see what really hit them and then they can focus on that you know, and now I'm doing Jim. What Jim is kind of doing too is what I just call a one-day drum intensive, which is three hours in the morning, four hours in the afternoon. We start with how to hold a stick, and then we go into rudiments, reading, 
at coordination, styles, <laughs> transcription, and at the end, they have to perform a transcription, a note-for-note -note transcription of a song for their peers. Yeah. And so it's a one day like, here you go. This is the bait, this is drumming in a nutshell. How you hold the sticks, here's the rudiments, you gotta read, you gotta play styles, you gotta be able to play with a click, and you gotta be able to play for a song. And then hopefully at the end of that day, they've had an amazing learning experience and they have met some new people that they'll keep in touch with for the rest of their lives. This is. You have great natural motivational skills. Is that something that you worked on or is it something that you fine tuned or is that something that you've just been this way? I read a lot of books. I mean, obviously, I, I, you know, I reread all the Napoleon Hill books every yeah, year, all the Tony Robbins books, all of the Zig books. You know, these are, these are our Zig, teachers. Zig, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, Wayne yeah. Dyer, you know, you soak the stuff up into your DNA. And that was really one of the first things I wanted to do with my drum clinics. I wanted to do a drum clinic that wasn't just like a 90 minute drum solo and then the limo picks you up outside, no questions. <laughs> you know, I mean, because those kind of days are over. Yeah. You know, there's only a couple of us, I feel like they're really keeping the drum clinic alive. Yeah. And some of the greatest clinicians and drummers in the world there we're lucky to get you know 60 people there yeah. you know you, you you pack them in but like if i do a, a sam ash or a guitar center and we do a lot of marketing it's like you're lucky you yeah. know the stanton moores and the shulmans and they were like yeah. we're, we're, we're like get 60 people all right because yeah. of the internet yes. and so i've been encouraging a lot of kids i say like it there's nothing better than shaking a hand with your the drummer and witnessing it firsthand yeah. and asking him questions and going home with a door prize and meeting people it's a community experience but no, I think, I think you might agree that people have that motivational gene. We're called to it. Absolutely. And then practice makes perfect. You know, just everyone says, well, I want to start speaking. I want to start doing clinics. I was like, well, do it. Yeah. And, and, and get footage and get testimonials and create a Facebook page and build. It's like, it's like building a business. It really is. It, really, like it really is building a business. Yeah. But, but, and you have and you continue to build it very wisely and you're taking it step by step and it's growing wonderfully well. So maintain this because you are affecting people in the most positive way. Thanks. In closing, now you have young kids that are watching this and people that are watching this for maybe years and years and generations and generations. What advice could you give to them that could motivate them, fire them up, let them see that there is a is hope in the music industry because they've got the passion for music in their soul. Right. And they really are just now looking for a way to be able to follow that dream as you continue to follow your dream. Sure. Man, that's a heavy question. I would say know why you're doing it. Only do it if it's something that makes you so happy that you want to do 24 hours a day, that you could see committing the rest of your... And, and I almost feel like you can't have everything. Like, whatever personal success I've had as a result of the music business has come at expense of some other things in my life. Yeah. It's, it's a difficult industry. It's a very difficult industry, but you have to do it because you love it. Right. You start with that, and then you must practice. You've got to get at least those 10,000 hours in, right? <laughs> we probably put in 10,000 hours by ourselves in a dark room before we even started playing with other musicians. So, because when we got on the bandstand, we were like, oh, I know what to do. Yeah. But then we had to go through all the time of telling, you're rushing, or you're dragging, or you're playing too much, or you're stepping on the vocal, right? right? But if you want to do anything in life, you can do it. And there has to be maybe no backup plan. Now, my backup plan was education, you know, I, I got a music education degree, but the method to my madness was, I'm gonna get this degree that's gonna take seven years, but that's gonna give me a long time to practice, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I would just say, if you love it, you're passionate about it, do it, go to where the action is. You must go to a New York or a Los Angeles or a Nashville. Those are the markets. Go to those places, mingle with people, find your tribe, and then just work really hard and be patient because it is a marathon not a sprint <laughs> if there's ever passion personified it's rich redmond oh man on behalf of the sessions we thank you so much you have done great thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having me. <laughs>